<laughs> Thank you. We did have a little bit of time because we're a little bit early for member statements, and uh, that's where we're going to turn now. Uh, the first member statement is the member from. Uh, you are all the way from Niagara Centre. Speaker, yes, well done. Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday, I had the honour of joining Community Support Services of Niagara to deliver food to local seniors participating in the Meals on Wheels program. CSSN is a critical contact for seniors, families, and caregivers. Thanks to them, families can go to work and rest assured that their loved one is cared for. By offering these supports, seniors are choosing to live in their homes longer and report better outcomes. Just two weeks ago, volunteers delivering meals to seniors noticed their health had begun to deteriorate. The agency was able to connect with the family and suggest supports. Within a week, the volunteers noticed a remarkable turnaround. At the height of the lockdown, CSSN doubled the amount of people using their services and the numbers of meals delivered. Despite the demand, Speaker, Community Services of Niagara and other community support organizations have not seen increases to their base funding in over a decade. On a little bit of faith and a lot of determination, they've been able to respond to the doubling demand for their meals on wheels services and even expand to create a program to deliver groceries to seniors. Speaker, incredible organizations like CSSN want to devote all of their energy to serving the community. As a consequence of chronic underfunding, more and more time is spent on fundraising. COVID exposed the issues in our current practices, but it also highlighted the importance of others. I hope this legislature uses the opportunity of this budget to properly fund community support services of Niagara and help our seniors stay in their homes for longer with more comfort and dignity. Thank you. Her statement is the member from Barry Innisville. Thank you, Speaker. Well, last week I had an opportunity to speak to uh, many of my constituents in Barrie Innisfil, and something that they had talked a lot about is post-COVID recovery and what are we doing to get uh, through it so that more people can be employed and they can have the dignity of a job. Uh, time and time again, they're sick of seeing handouts. They want to see a hand up. And so I was proud to tell them and discuss with them, and I want to update them in this legislature today on what this government is doing on the skills trades front and getting people back to work as they are uh, as, as you may be aware, COVID-19, we put in a recovery assistance skills plan, which includes retooling our second careers program to support laid off workers and investing in micro-credentialing, employment services and training progr programs, including apprenticeships. We're dedicating funding through Employment Ontario skills training so that more people can get jobs that match their skills and, of course, they can upgrade any skills they need. We're also supporting workers to acquire in-demand skills through micro-credentialing, uh, and that will be done through an online portal and of course those students who are young and are looking to apply their OSAP money towards micro-credentialing they can now do that but that's just not it speaker we're also simplifying the system we're investing in the tools grant so more people can help with those tools they, they need we're investing in the correction system so more people can be employed in, pu in, in the public safety ser services and of course investing in more PSW training and supporting them through that and our young people our future generation investing in the skills trades they're going to need for the future Future jobs. Speaker, by giving every person in Ontario the opportunity to reach their full potential, the province's recovery will be swifter and more robust, setting Ontario on a path to a strong economic rebound. Thank you. Next member statement, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. This morning I asked the Associate Minister of Transportation to meet with my constituents who are represented by the group Save Jimmy Simpson. Since late February, my constituents have, who live along what will be the above-ground section of the Ontario line have been trying to secure a meeting with the Associate Minister to discuss the impact of the line and their dissatisfaction with Metrolinx's feeble consultation process. If consultation with Metrolinx was real, vigorous, and resulted in improvements to the line that made it more compatible with the community, then the residents in my community would not be trying to meet with the Associate Minister, but that is not the case. So my constituents, through their group, Save Jimmy Simpson, wrote the Associate Minister asking to meet to discuss their concerns. This is a democracy. When people are not happy with the decisions or actions of bureaucrats, they know they have to go up the chain of decision-making to talk to the elected 
decision makers. So far, they have simply been told to go back to Metrolinx. They wrote, we call upon you to consider our urgent fears for the health and well-being of our community. We would welcome an opportunity to meet virtually with you to discuss our issues and seek your advice as to the best ways to ensure our concerns are heard by the appropriate decision makers. Speaker, in a democracy, citizens need to be able to meet with elected decision makers. I ask the associate, associate minister to meet with the citizens. Thank you. Thank you. The next member's statement, the member for Glengarry, Prescott and Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. President, les gens de Mr. Speaker, people in Glengarry, Prescott, Russell have been absolutely extraordinary during this difficult period, and I'd like to take this time to sincerely thank all the people in my riding, as well as those who continue to work during this pandemic. First of all, to those who have lost a loved one, my heart goes out to you and your family. To our communities, Rockland, Bourget, Hawkesbury, Alexandria, Maxville, Marionville, thank you. I'm inspired by your hard work and the devotion of so many people in our communities. It's truly incredible. To all our frontline workers, doctors, nurses, and all those who work in the medical field, thank you. To our teachers and education workers, thank you. To our small business owners, thank you. And to all our unknown heroes, truck drivers, uh, grocery store workers, all those who move our economy forward and have an, an impact on our daily life in many ways, small and large. And to our medical officers of health, Dr. Paul and Dr. Etches, thank you for constantly informing us and looking and, and being concerned with our health and safety, often creatively and with much humor. It's a way to put a smile on our faces. Extremely difficult. Physical distancing, not being close to our loved ones, our family, our friends, it takes a toll on us. Human interactions, real, live ones, are essential to our mental health. But we will get through this. These are difficult measures, but we have seen these measures work, Mr. Speaker. Even with the arrival of vaccines, these measures are necessary. Let us continue to be vigilant, to wear our masks, to support our small businesses, and to socialize online, all the while using this time to plan for the future. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm thrilled to be able to rise in the House and speak today in celebration of the bicentennial celebration of Greek Independence Day. Every year on March 25th, since 1821, Greeks around the world commemorate this day. This year is extra special for us as it marks 200 years since we liberated our country out from Ottoman rule by rising up in a war of independence. This year we celebrate with more fervor and passion than ever before. A very impressive feat if you are familiar with the passion and zest for life, the kefi, that Greeks have on any given day. We are so proud to come from a long line of fighters who stand up for their country, their culture, their religion, their way of life, and above all, for freedom. In 1821, we committed to freedom or death, eleftheria y thanatos, and we meant it. This fighting spirit has stayed with the Greek people, both those living in Greece and those like me who are part of the diaspora. This day reminds us of our people's accomplishments and encourages us to continue to stand for freedom, both in Greece and around the world. Not everyone lives in a free country. In fact, many don't. And Greek Canadians are especially proud to live in a strong democratic country such as Canada. I honour my ancestors today and I commit to follow in their footsteps and do everything that I can to safeguard the freedoms that we hold so dear. While Greece is free and while Greeks around the world proudly and loudly stand for freedom and against tyranny and oppression, all people and countries can dream of freedom too. Zito y helada que zito o canadas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Hamilton now. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Regeneration Community Services provides services for people with complex mental health and addiction issues. The workers there are QP Local 4891. These are residential support workers, mental health workers, addiction case ma uh, managers, peer and housing support workers, maintenance, kitchen, housing staff, housekeeping staff that keep the place running. Unfortunately, these workers might go on strike.
To keep up with the cost of living, these workers need the 1 per cent wage increase allowable under the terrible Bill 124. Regeneration simply doesn't have the funds to provide this modest increase and are asking for a three-year wage freeze. Staff can't afford to keep falling behind. In the aftermath of this pandemic, Speaker, we are going to see the need for mental health services rise in every community across Ontario. Experts are already calling it the fourth wave. This government must provide community mental health organizations like Regenerations the funds it needs to ensure that it has a stable workforce and can deliver the much-needed services. Ontarians will need mental health support in the aftermath of this pandemic. The government must ensure that it is available by adequately funding these community mental health services. I have already provided the Ministers of Health, Labour and Mental Health a letter to explain this. I hope to hear back soon. Thank you very much. Member Statements. Member for Chatham-Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Speaker. Recently, I met via Zoom with two key individuals from ProResp, a community respiratory therapy organization. And I would like to thank Kim Johnstone, Regional Manager West, and Jennifer DeMars, manager of the Chatham branch, for their valuable input. Both are registered respiratory therapists, also known as RRTs. ProResp is celebrating their 40th anniversary this year. They are an essential service with a staff of over 300 including 85 RRTs and 26 RT managers in 27 locations in the province. What amazes me is the number 1,000. That's the number of Ontarians who suffered from COVID-19, whom ProRest brought home from the hospital to recover in the safety and comfort of their own home. They know that their clients are more susceptible and even more fearful of COVID due to their chronic respiratory illness. Uh, by working alongside the overworked doctors, nurses, and respiratory therapists in hospitals across Ontario, patients can go home safely, thus enlightening the load, thus lightening the load, so others can focus on the most severe cases. Through this pandemic, ProRest continues to, in, uh, to conduct in-home respiratory assessments and conduct wellness phone checks of their clients while maintaining strong relationships with their in-home clients, long-term care, physicians, hospitals, retirement homes, and hospices throughout Ontario. Their motto remains, we never stop caring and we never will. Thank you, ProRest, and again, again, congratulations on celebrating 40 years of serving Ontario. Thank you very much. The next member statement, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, uh, make the House aware of the state of home care in certain parts of the province, especially Temiskaming Cochrane. And I'd like to tell you a story about Jacqueline in Iroquois Falls. Jacqueline is in her 80s, and she qualifies for 15 hours a week of home care. But it's actually not for Jacqueline. It's for her son. He's 60 and he has been bedridden for the last 20 years. Jacqueline takes care of her son. She qualifies for 15 hours a week. Some hours, some weeks she gets one, some weeks she gets two. When our office intervenes, she gets a bit more. And the reason being, they can't find PSWs. The, 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 the for-profit company cannot find PSWs. And as a result, Jacqueline is in crisis. So now Jacqueline has taken upon herself to hire PSWs herself from her son's, from her pension and from her son's uh, uh, pension as well. And you know what? The PSWs exist because Jacqueline pays them a living wage. And that's something we could learn from. People who qualify can't get it, and they have to pay for themselves because they pay a living wage. Why doesn't the private home care company do the same? Thank you. Thank you very much. Member for Markham Union Bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In February, I had the pleasure of co-hosting a virtual Lunar New Year celebration in my riding of Markham Unionville with the Member of Parliament, Bob Sarayer. Lunar New Year symbolized prosperity and good fortune 
and is one of the most significant holidays celebrated by many Canadians of East and Southeast Asian descent. Although we were not able to celebrate like previous years, I was happy to co-host this virtual event with MP Soraya to bring our community together from the comfort of our own home. As this event, we were joined by over 300 attendees and honourable guests, including Senator Victor O, oh, the leader of the opposition, uh, official opposition of Canada, the Honourable Erin O'Toole, the Premier of Ontario, Honourable Doug Ford, and fellow MPPs. I want to thank everyone who attended and made that night unforgettable. Mr. Speaker, while most Ontarians welcome multiculturalism and respect one another, I want to recognize the rise in verbal harassment and physical attacks towards Canadian of East and Southeast Asian descent, which significantly rose at our province and across Canada since the beginning of the pandemic. These actions should not be tolerated and it should not be bypassed. Mr. Speaker, our province was built from, one, from the backs of Ontarians from different cultures and backgrounds. And no one should walk down a public space in fear. As a government, we will always condemn any form of racism and will continue to confront and stand against these hateful crimes. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Mississauga Centre. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur. Thank you, Speaker. I'm very proud to take the floor before this assembly to celebrate the Francophone community in this province. Last Saturday, March 20th, was the International um, Week of La Francophonie, which is an opportunity to, rep to recognize the important role of the Francophone community here in Ontario and throughout the world. The Franco-Ontarian community is. Part of this pro has been part of this province for more than 400 years. There are now more than one million people who speak French in Ontario. These communities have made major contributions to cultural, social, and economic to the cultural, social, and economic development of this province. This is why the Franco-Ontarian flag flies now before various buildings as an official emblem of Ontario. We can all find small ways to recognize the Francophone community every day. I'm particularly proud of my Francophone colleagues and the, my Francophile colleagues, as well of all those who are learning French. Let us continue to work together every day to support the flourishing of the Francophone community in Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements this morning. I've been advised that the Leader of the Opposition has a point of order that she wishes to raise. I'll recognize her. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I, um, I, sp I, speak, um, I, I bring forward a, a motion to have a moment of silence because of the recent tragedy that occurred in Atlanta. Uh, it's just the latest in a disturbing rise of anti-Asian racism that has only grown over the course of the pandemic. Unfortunately, Canada has also seen an increase in anti-Asian racism, and people are looking for us as leaders to stand with them in the fight against hate, and I was really um, happy to hear the government member speaking about this very issue a minute ago. So I seek unanimous consent for the House to observe a moment of silence for the victims of the recent mass shooting in Atlanta to condemn the disturbing rise of anti-Asian racism and hate crimes across North America and convey our collective commitment to aggressively fighting anti-Asian racism here in Ontario. Leader, the opposition is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to observe a moment of silence for the victims of the recent mass shooting in Atlanta to condemn the disturbing rise of anti-Asian racism and hate crimes across North America and convey our collective commitment to aggressively fight anti-Asian racism here in Ontario. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Last members to rise.
Thank you. Members may take their seats.